I'm going to go ahead and I have some slides which are not too onerous, I hope, and then I'm really hoping we'll have plenty of time for question and answer in which I will be very happy to um, field your questions about your specific organizations. It, as Amy mentioned, I accidentally fell into uh, this mission. I was the executive director of a nonprofit uh, community health clinic uh, that I helped found for 19 years. And I left there planning to do something completely different and had a couple of uh, friends and colleagues ask me if I could just consult on the financial side of their nonprofits. And in the course of doing that, I discovered that they hadn't applied for the employee retention tax credit, um, which is one of the most lucrative programs that uh, was part of the COVID relief package. And so I just started helping people do that and contacting friends who are on boards and saying, hey, did your organization look at this? And what I heard almost always was, no, it just seemed too complicated or we think we don't apply. And that was in November of 2022. It's now May of 2023, and I've helped over 50 nonprofits claim over $6 million of this money. Um, and we'll talk more about that, but it's there's a lot of money that's being left on the table here that is really over and over and over, I hear, game-changing money. Um, so I wanna just give you an overview today and uh, so that you'll hopefully leave this webinar with a sense of whether it's something worth looking into um, for your organization. And um, so we'll get started. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And um, we will start. So our agenda is, uh, well, I'll give you a little overview. We'll talk about how organizations determine if they're eligible at all. There's two pathways to eligibility. I'll talk a little bit about how one goes about calculating uh, how much you can get, then the process for claiming it. And then I have a few little um, case studies to offer in case they you know, make you say, oh, wow, that happened to us. Um, and then next steps and contact info in case you want to reach out to me directly to talk more about it. The, I have to say that in almost every case that I've done this, people engage and then um, and then when I get back to them with the third email that says great news, they uh, they're like, oh my God, it's too good to be true. And they didn't actually believe it was possible. And we we're talking about some very significant funds. So we'll talk more about that. Um, so the ERC, it's uh, Employee Retention Tax Credit and it's called either ERTC or ERC. And it was designed specifically to help organizations and businesses that were adversely impacted by COVID and continued to maintain payroll. Those are the two criteria. Um, it was designed to acknowledge the challenges of operating during the pandemic. And basically what I say is it was kind of a thank you for not laying everyone off. Um, because there was a huge burden on the unemployment system. Um, you didn't actually even have to be adversely financially impacted by COVID because a lot of places did pretty well with all of the relief money. You needed to keep your payroll going. So we'll talk more about that. So it was, an, it was I won't spend a long time on this slide, but it first came out in 2020 as part of the CARES Act. Um, and in 2020, you were allowed to apply for up to 50% of a maximum of $10,000 of wages and qualified expense. So the maximum credit available for 2020, all three quarters that were impacted by COVID uh, is $5,000 per employee. But then in the Consolidations Appropriation Act, they changed it. And later, as part of this package, I have a link to a comparison between 20 and 21. Um, but they increased it to 70% of up to $10,000 per quarter. So $7,000 $7, of credit per quarter is a possibility. Um, and that's when you're getting these scary calls from these um, companies that have spread it up and they say that up to $26,000 an employee, they're saying 5,000 for 2020 and 7,000 for each of the first three quarters of, 
of 2021. And then it was revised once again, um, but really by the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, they dropped Q4 of, of 2021 initially. Um, well, actually with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, it was available through all of 2021 and they rolled it back so that only uh, recovery startup businesses are eligible for Q4 2021. Everyone else the last quarter you could be eligible for is um, Q3. So there's two main paths to determine if you're eligible. Um, the first, which is the most straightforward, is if your organization experienced what they call a significant decline in gross receipts as compared to pre-pandemic. And the way that's determined is you look on a quarter by quarter basis using calendar quarters only, and you compare the, like you compare Q3 of 2020 with Q3 of 2019. Q4 of 2020 with Q4 of 2019. Um, in 2020, you needed to have at least one quarter in which you experienced a 50% decline in gross receipts when you compare that quarter to the same quarter in 2019. In 2020, you're still comparing to 2019 and you need to have experienced at least a 20% decline in gross receipts and the asterisk is just uh, that I already mentioned that Q4 is possible for uh, startup businesses only. So what counts as gross receipts? Everything except realized gains on investment. So unrealized gains do not. So if you have an endowment or something like that and you had to draw on it, um, then that can go against you. You have when you, when you're looking to do this comparison, you run your profit and loss statements using the same accounting basis, accrual or cash that you use for your 990. So in some cases, um, you might just have a timing issue that things got slowed down during the pandemic and that grant that you usually receive in Q2 of um, actually arrived in Q3. And so your Q2 comparisons are favorable and your Q3s are not. Um, there's one big exception to this, and it's really great news, which is that when we do the calculations about a significant decline in gross receipts, we back out any other COVID funding you received, including PPP, IDLE, or shuttered venue. They don't count um, as, as um, gross receipts. So you get to back out unrealized gains and any other COVID relief. And that's a real gotcha, like a lot of people are missing because they run their reports and they don't, and they they got that big PPP loan and they don't back it out. So they think they're not eligible. When I review the profit and loss statements, the one of the things I ask for is all the PPP information so that I can back that out and get a real comparison. So this is something that I've run into a lot of people, including me in my previous life used pay data um, and this is a mistake that I have found that pay data has made a number of times. Um, and I imagine other, other supposed ERTC experts have made it as well that um, the IRS language is very um, unclear. I don't know if that's on purpose or not, but, um, but the pro tip is that if you are eligible based on a decline in gross receipts in one quarter, you're almost always automatically eligible for the next quarter. So in 2020, that's less of an issue because you only have a max of 10,000 in, in wages and qualified health insurance that you can use. But if you have lower paid people who don't earn $10,000 in a quarter, you get to continue to apply in subsequent um, quarters so eligibility ends, this is how they write it, I'm sorry, I, I, this is a direct quote from the IRS, so I apologize for how poorly it is written, but um, eligibility ends in the first calendar quarter after the calendar quarter in which gross receipts are greater than 80% of gross receipts for the same calendar quarter. I have an example on the next slide that shows what that means, but basically what it means is if you were down 50%, you're eligible. Your next quarter, you're at 75%. It's okay because you're not at 80. And even if you were at 80, 
you, if you're at 110%, you still get that next quarter because it ends the following quarter. So in 2021, they said they changed the language a little bit um, and they call it an alternative quarter election rule. And what that means is that when you're evaluating if you're eligible, you get to look back to the prior quarter. And if you would have been eligible in the prior quarter, then you're eligible in that quarter. So for Q1 2021, you um, had your decline in gross receipts was 25%, you're eligible. In Q2, you actually got that huge grant I was just talking about and you had 300% compared to 2019, you still get to claim for that quarter because you look back to the prior one. And where that makes a big difference is um, if you were in Q4 of 2020 and you didn't hit the 50% threshold, you were at 70 and then you get to Q1 of 2021 and you don't hit the 20%, you get to claim because you were eligible in the prior quarter. And that makes a big difference in the 2021 quarters because they're up to $7,000 an employee and that's a lot of a lot of money for any nonprofit. Um, I'm, I know this is all like, probably makes a lot of people's heads spin and we'll talk through actual examples and then it, then it makes a little more sense and it's a little less tedious. Um, but this is an example of what happens um, using the alternative quarter. So start from the left in Q2 of 2020, there was a 40% decline compared to Q2 2019. And the organization would not be eligible in that case because the threshold is a 50% decline. The next quarter, there was a decline of 51%. So they are eligible because the threshold is 50. In Q4 of 2020, the decline is 75%. If that was standalone, they wouldn't be eligible because in 2020, the cutoff is 50%, but they are eligible because eligibility ends the quarter after the quarter in which you exceed 80% and they're only 75%. In Q1 of 2021, the decline is 90%. So in theory, they wouldn't be eligible because in 2021, the, eligible, the threshold is 80, but using the alternative quarter rule, you get to look back and Lo and behold, in Q4 2020, they were at 75, so they're eligible. Uh, let me, I'll just pause for a second. The organization that I use this example from, they were told that they were eligible for two quarters when they were actually eligible for five. Their payroll for Q1 2021 was $300,000, and they got an additional 200,000 just for that one quarter because of this alternative quarter rule that, that um, their payroll company had missed. So we move on to Q2 2021, decline is 73%. That's great, threshold's 80, you're golden. And then Q3 2021, whoop, we're over 80 again, but you're still eligible because you get to look back to Q2, which was 73%, and so you get another quarter. Um, so this is how it can add up. I recently did a nonprofit in Vermont uh, that their entire credit, they were, they were a large organization, um, but it was over $1.2 million in, in employee retention tax credit. The smallest one I've done is 15,000 and that was for a one person office. Um, so the reason I'm stressing that is it's a lot of money and it makes a huge difference for any nonprofit. I, I dropped one off the other day for a little nonprofit that was $16,000 and the guy burst into tears um, because he said that's, that's gonna you know, save us for another year. So um, no amount is too small, <laughs> I think. Um, the second way that you qualify, if you, the, the most straightforward way is that that decline in gross receipts. The second way is if your organization um, experienced a full or partial shutdown due to government order or mandate. And I'm just gonna stress that this is an either or. You, you don't have to have both a decline in receipts and a shutdown. You had a decline or you had a shutdown. Now this is an area where 
there's a lot of misinformation out there. Someone just forwarded me something that one of the companies that has sprouted up to do employee retention tax credits sent to the automotive uh, sale, uh, car salesman. And it said, if you had to sanitize, that was an inconvenience and you're eligible. That's simply not true. I had a, another nonprofit that I just evaluated recently that had been told they were eligible for over $4 million and they weren't eligible at all. Um, so a lot of those things are scams. There are very specific tests that you have to pass to be to to file for partial shutdown. And I've done quite a bit of it. And at the end of this, uh, my slides, I have a link to um, uh, the IRS document that explains this. But a significant disruption means. Well, we'll start with the more than nominal, the first part of the test. You, if you, if the restrictions that were put in place resulted in a significant disruption or sus suspension of what was considered a more than nominal aspect of your business prior to the pandemic, then you might be eligible for the period in which those mandates or orders were in place. So the more than nominal, we'll start with that. Prior to the pandemic, that aspect of your of your cash flow, your revenue, had to it had to represent more than ten percent of total revenue in a in a specific quarter. Or the even more complicated way to qualify is that if the number of of service hours your employees dedicated to that aspect of your business was more than ten percent of total service hours. So for example, I worked with a uh, organization that's a food shelf, a day shelter, um, they have showers, they have hangout space, and they had to close all of that down and switch to delivering meals. And prior to the pandemic, the number of hours their staff dedicated to the shelter and the um, day space was more than 10% of the total hours that they had for the quarter. So that was a more than nominal aspect of the business. I have worked with a church where the um, choir master and the sexton uh, stopped working because they couldn't do anything in, in person. And prior to the pandemic, their salaries, their hours, their hours worked was more than 10% of total hours worked for the church. So during the time that they were not allowed to have have in-person meetings, then they were eligible. Um, so the second part of the test, once you've determined what is a more than nominal aspect of the business is, did that aspect of the business suffer at least a 10% decline compared to pre-pandemic? Um, and what's important, uh, I'll have two examples coming up, but what's important and is that the decline has to be due to government mandate or order. It can't be that you were being cautious and we would need to demonstrate which order it is. So for example, I was just working with a nonprofit that offers uh, prenatal care to indigent women in Florida and Florida was closed for about 10 minutes during pandemic. There, there were no precautions in place. This organization stopped seeing women for quite a long time um, because of the nature of their work and the high risk of their clientele, but they were not eligible because they were being cautious. They, it had to be that they were not allowed to serve these people. And it also, the other, I'm working with a, um, a nonprofit up in Maine that's at a wildlife refuge that is also a wedding venue and people book weddings years in advance and um, they're near the Canadian border and the border was closed and they are only eligible for the period of time in which they're, they were under strict restrictions around capacity and social distancing. The fact that people can't get to you doesn't qualify. The fact that if they did get to you, you couldn't serve them, that is the shutdown. So hopefully that's clear. Like the, in Maine, you had, if you traveled, there was a two week um, quarantine. That doesn't make it uh, a, a government shutdown for you. The fact that if, if they actually came to your door, you had to say, I'm sorry, we can't serve you because of these rules. That's what, that's what makes it a shutdown.
So here's two examples. The main one that the IRS uses is a really easy one. A restaurant um, has to close their inside dining and pivots to takeout only. Um, even if they were wildly successful at it, if they're not allowed to do in-house dining and prior to the pandemic, in-house dining represented 10% or more of their revenue. And because they weren't allowed to do it by mandate, they saw a revenue drop of at least 10%, then they're eligible. And they're eligible until they're allowed to have people back in the dining room at, in a capacity that is comparable to, to what they had before. So if they initially you know, could, ha could have 50 people and because of social distancing, they could only have 20, that's still a partial shutdown unless they raised their prices 3,000% and ended up making more money. So a really very common example of that for nonprofits is fundraising events. And this is one place that I always ask people. Um, and my question that I ask you ask is, was that fundraising is, I say the answer to this is yes. Was that fundraising event an annual event that you used to have? And it usually was, and it usually was not, was either canceled depending if it was in 2020 or just not scheduled in 2021 because of the stay home, stay safe restrictions on in-person gather, gatherings. If in the past that event had generated 10% or more of total revenue for the quarter in which it occurred, and because you couldn't have it, you saw a decline in in-person events of at least 10%, during the quarter in which it would have occurred in 20 or 21, then you would be eligible. That meets the test for partial shutdown. And so, for example, I worked with the Boys and Girls Club who would do a bowl for kids sake every year in April. So it was canceled in April of 2020 and it was canceled. It didn't was never scheduled in April of 2021. They were eligible for ERC for both of those quarters because in April of 2019, that event generated more than 10% of the revenue for the quarter. I wish I could see you all and ask if this is making sense, but um, I'm happy to take a lot of questions afterwards and, and clarify things. So, okay, so you qualified by either pathway one, decline in receipts, or through par partial shutdown, how much money do we get and when will it come? So the amount of the ERC depends on the size of your payroll because it's calculated on a per person basis. Um, so in 2020, you have to have at least one quarter in which your gross receipts declined at least 50% or you had to have the partial shutdown. We calculate the credit at 50% up to a maximum of $10,000 in qualified wages and healthcare expense. Qualified wages are calculated after we back out any wages used for PPP forgiveness. And qualified health expense can be used. So let's say you have an, you have an employee that um, in, in 2020 only earned $8,000. So their, their credit max using wages would then be $4,000. If you paid health expense for that employee, we can add that expense in to increase the amount that's eligible. Eligible. So let's say they had $1,200 of health expense. Now they're up to $9,200 and their credit is $4,600. Um, we can use qualified health expense is either employer paid or employee paid if using pre-tax dollars via section 125. Um, and again, we can only use qualified health expense that was not used for PPP forgiveness. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and because you know, not everyone makes $40,000 a year or PPP forgiveness might've used up some of the wages, you might have to apply for more than one quarter in 2020 to get up to the 10,000 um, max. But that usually works out if, there's, if the one quarter that you're eligible for on the 50% is not Q4, then you're, then you're automatically gonna get the next quarter. So we can, we can look at more than one quarter to get 
to maximize um, the wages per person and and do other things like when we're looking at PPP forgiveness, let's say you have an employee who makes a lot of money. Um, let's say they make $20,000 a quarter. Well, we can only count 10,000. So 10, the other 10 will automatically go towards the PPP forgiveness. So then if you have an employee who only makes 3,000, we'll try not to take their pay towards PPP forgiveness and max out how much we can get for each person. It's a kind of a puzzle, but one that I've come to enjoy a lot because of all the funds I can get from my nonprofit clients. Um, in 2021, it's, it's much richer. You have to have a 20% decline when you compare it to 2019 or again, the shutdown. In this case, the credit is 70% of up to $10,000. So that's $7,000 per employee per quarter max. And again, qualified wages are calculated after backing out any wages used for PPP forgiveness. Qualified health expense, um, same thing, can be used to bring somebody up to the 10,000 for the quarter. So again, you have an employee who earns $8,000 a quarter, but you're paying $500 a month for health insurance. So that's another 1,500. So now you're up to whatever I just said. I think I said 8,000. Um, so you're up to 9,500, so you get 70% 70, 70 of 9,500. Um, and the max, um, the total that's possible for an employee in 2021 is $21,000, 7,000 for credit, uh, 7,000 per employee per quarter in Q1 to Q3. Okay, I'm dating myself with the Fig Newton cartoon, but I couldn't help it. Um, that it's really important, you cannot double dip on PPP or SVOG wages. Initially, you couldn't get ERC if you had PPP, but when they revised it, that was changed and it doesn't make you ineligible, you just cannot use the same wages twice. So if you, so for example, you got a PPP loan of $100,000 um, in April of 2020. and your payroll for that quarter, which is Q2 of 2020, was $200,000. You can apply for ERC for the, the 100,000 that you didn't use for PPP forgiveness. Um, and that, it would be nice if it was always that simple. It's usually spread out over multiple quarters. In some cases, people actually have created um, spreadsheets of exactly how much money per person is being used for PPP forgiveness, in which case we have to back that out on a per pay person basis. But we cannot use any wages or health expense that were used for PPP forgiveness, but there's almost always leftover. And so that's why almost everyone who was eligible for PPP ends up being eligible for ERC because the PPP was only for two and a half months of payroll and a quarter is three months. So there's usually at least a half a month of payroll that wasn't uh, covered by pay PPP. I had one client who was absolutely adamant that they were not eligible because they'd gotten two enormous PPPs um, and they ended up being eligible for over $600,000 because their payroll was quite, a, you know, they were another large organization and their payroll was big, which is why, you know, the bigger the PPP, the more likely the bigger the, the employee retention tax credit. And then again, you can only use $10,000 in wages per quarter per employee. So if you're doing this yourself, when you go to back out PPP forgiveness, um, you have a number you have to hit, like you claimed three, $30,000 in PPP forgiveness in a, um, in the quarter, and you so you need to disallow thirty thousand dollars of wages. So start out with anyone who made over ten thousand, anything over, you take off your PPP forgiveness so that you work down to be able to maximize the credit on a per person basis. Okay, how do we get it now that we know how much we're getting? This money is claimed by filing amended uh, payroll tax returns, which are uh, 
Federal Form 941, and you use a form called a 941X. Um, and it's kind of a confusing form, but once you know how to do it, it's or your whoever prepares your 941s can do it for you. Um, and what you need to be able to do it is you need the original 941 that you're amending. And you need to know how much credit you're eligible for. You need to be able to put the amount of qualified wages you use to do the calculation and any qualified health expense if you have it. And you need to be able to explain why you're claiming it. And if you're claiming it based on full or partial shutdown, you need to be, when I fill these out, I cite the, the government order, which can be any government order um, or mandate that impacted you and how it impacted you. And I worked with someone who's in South Dakota and they're, they build foster villages for Native American children in, in um, South Dakota and they're, they were shut down by the tribal order that forbid any volunteers from coming onto the reservation. So that was the government order that we used. It can be, I just worked with someone in Santa Cruz, California, and it was their health officer. Here, if you're in Vermont, uh, Governor Scott's orders are were pretty clear and uh, not, too, not too difficult to apply. Um, you do need to mail amended returns. Uh, 941s are usually filed electronically, but the amended returns have to be mailed and they require a wet signature, not a digital signature. And you also need extreme patience because this money does not come quickly. It, right now they're saying it takes between eight and 16 months to get the money. It does arrive in the form of a check, um, those pretty checks with the Statue of Liberty on them. Um, and some things that I'm reading say that they have over a million 941s they haven't processed yet, and they're processing those before they do the amended returns. I'm not sure that I believe that because when I was running the community health clinic, I am, uh, filed for the first quarter using an amended return and we got the money. And every subsequent quarter I was able to file real time. So we brought in over 400,000 of this money and it didn't take that long, but um, I do believe that it will take months, not weeks. And I think there's, there's some rumor that the smaller organizations may see their money more quickly. Um, I recommend mailing your many return certified mail so that you at least know they arrived. And contrary to what you might, might read on the web, you cannot check the status of your returns online, you can call. And my understanding is that that's worse than getting a root canal and you probably won't get an answer, but you could try. Um, these are just some resources that'll be in the packet. There are links to um, the various IRS documents that explain the program. They explain how to navigate the significant decline um, and partial suspension tests, and a blog post that I wrote for Andy Robinson's Trade Your Board series that gives a synopsis. Uh, if you do end up working um, with anyone or with me or try to do this on your own, what I find is that, you know, I really like people to understand what they're signing. And so these things are helpful for board members who might have some questions, because it does seem good, too good to be true when you suddenly say, wow, look, we're getting 25, 300, a million. It's, how is that even possible? Um, I'm gonna give you a few examples quickly of um, some of the um, experiences I've had with some of my other nonprofit clients, and then we'll be able to have a question and answer pretty soon. Um, the claims, as I say, have ranged from 15,000 to 1.2 million um, at this point. And I've worked with over 50 nonprofits to claim over 6 million. Um, very common scenarios are cancellation of in-person programming, cancellation of funding, fundraising events, partial shutdown due to capacity restrictions for social distancing, a drop in membership or patronage due to restrictions, which typically also is in-person programming, 
Um, and then in uh, one case, an inability to meet with donors face to face resulted in a major decline of major donations. Um, of the many nonprofits I've worked with, less than 10, I think there have been five, five total that did not qualify at all. And in that case, they were either completely grant funded and nothing changed for them um, in terms of their revenue streams or the way they did business. Um, they acted as the distributor for mutual funds, for example, organizations that were uh, passed out the everyone eats money were, uh, yeah, that was a disability from the standpoint of this program because it looked like they received all that money even though they didn't. They were just funneling it through, it still disqualifies them. Um, or I had a couple of clients who said, wow, this is a great time to do a capital campaign. And um, so they started their capital campaigns during the pandemic and that meant that they had an influx of cash which made them ineligible. I had one though that had a capital campaign and still is eligible though because of the partial shutdown because they weren't able to do the work that they usually did. It was a painting school um, and they couldn't do any in-person. So they were eligible for partial shutdown even though they raised a bunch of money for their capital campaign. Um, so here's some examples. Um, a little newspaper, I was like, why would they qualify? Well, all of their clients uh, had, had to close so they didn't advertise and they got over 65,000. Um, I've worked with uh, several theaters that were closed um, and they couldn't do any in-person. And even though they, in the spring they pivoted to outside, they had a decline in gross receipts. And um, in each case, they were very small organizations, but they um, were eligible for over 50,000. Um, uh, the wedding venue I already told you about. And, um, oh, I've worked with a couple of independent schools that had to cancel their annual fundraising and events. And in each case, they had very significant ERC. You don't have to have the decline in revenue due to COVID actually. That's um, that, for example, we had, uh, I worked with uh, several humane societies and one of them was doing a capital campaign and their then executive director kind of panicked and stopped the capital campaign. And so they had had all this money come in in 2019 for the capital campaign and then no money in 2020 and 2021. So their operations were okay, but because of the way the program is written, it's about gross receipts and they count capital campaign against you and it counts for you. So in that case, that organization was eligible for a couple hundred thousand dollars because they took a pause in their capital campaign. They actually did better because everyone was adopting animals during the pandemic. Um, I mentioned I worked with the church. I've worked with only a handful of organizations that we've used the partial shutdown based on hours um, and service hours, it's a little complicated, but for a church, uh, you know, it turns out that church's money comes from people that go to church and they gave money whether they were going to church or not, but the church was eligible because they had, um, they had to stop their in-person programming, but they kept the people on staff who would have been providing um, their choir master and their sexton. At a residential school that had to send their students home, um, they were adamant they weren't gonna be eligible um, and ended up being eligible for over half a million dollars. Um, and then another uh, very straightforward, actually I reached out initially to my local hospice because they had thrift stores and I knew they'd had to close them and I knew it was their primary source of revenue. And um, they had had to close their thrift stores and, and again, were eligible due to the decline in gross receipts. So really encourage you to think about what happened when I do the, my initial discovery calls, I just start with what happened? What, what was it like and what did you do? And then I combine that with the review of the profit and loss statement and see what I see in the numbers. But understanding, because people were magnificently creative about how they pivoted and what they did and how they 
manage this and you know just incredible stories and um and and you can still get even if you're successful you can still take advantage of some of this money this money is available to for-profits and non-profits and part of why i'm so committed to getting into the nonprofits is because we we've heard the stories of what happened with ppp like I want the nonprofits to get this. The Kardashians are going to be getting it. The Celtics are probably going to be getting it. Nonprofits should be getting it too. Um, so what's next? Um, the there are some deadlines, but they're quite a while out. Um, you claim this by amending the the um, nine forty one. And they have to be filed for 2020. The deadline to file is April 15th, 2024. And for 2021, the deadline is April 15th, 2025. So we have a long time. But having said that, remember, it also can take between eight and 16 months to get your refund. And that's just that timeline is going to get longer and longer as people get closer to the deadline and nervous about it. So I'd say don't. Don't wait too long. Um, this seems like it's too good to be true. It's not, it's real. I've seen the money. It really truly is an opportunity to bring money in. Um, and there are a lot of really, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I want to say. There are a lot of companies that have uh, sprouted up that I've heard story after story of people getting frightening phone calls. This is an this is a important legal matter I need to discuss with you. Um, you're you know you're missing an opportunity. This is a tax related matter I need to speak with you. Uh, you're eligible. Your organization is they take a look at how much PPP people get and then they send out these things saying, I mean I work for a small nonprofit that's eligible for about three hundred thousand, and I recently got one saying that they would be eligible for three million dollars. I mean it's just completely ridiculous. And these places are offering to do this service for you for as low as thirty percent of the credit claimed, which is just outrageously um, uh, inappropriate and frustrating. Which is why I started this project because I just was completely horrified. And I've talked to a number of people who said, oh, well, we, we went ahead and did it. You know, they they only wanted 20%. Um, so I say you should definitely look into it. Everyone should look into it, but please either talk to your financial advisor or somebody you trust to work with the pro in the process. And if you choose, that could be me. Um, I do not, for Vermont nonprofits, actually at this point for everyone, but for Vermont nonprofits, I don't charge anyone if they're not eligible. So I do the review um, with you. And then if it turns out your organization isn't eligible, then there's no charge. So it's risk-free. And then I, um, I didn't want to put it on here. I will say it to those of you that are here, but I withhold the right to change my rates at some point. But um, I cap the amount I charge for mount nonprofits at one and a half percent of the total credit, which is, I, I know, ridiculous, but I'm really committed to getting this money um, in the hands of, of the nonprofits in Vermont. I, and so regardless of how much you get, you won't pay me more than one and a half percent of that. And if money is really tight, then I actually offer people the opportunity to not pay till the money arrives. Though in that case, I charge a little bit more. So um, this is my contact information. I think this is going to go out to people, but I start the process with a 30 minute discovery call um, where you can learn more about the process and I learn more about your organization. Um, and you can also email me. And thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully there's a lot of questions. And I apologize for that being so fast, but I watched a couple of these and they were really boring. I didn't, I didn't want to have it just be a big dump of, of numbers and calculations. I hope that gives you a sense of, of whether you might, it might be something for your organization to pursue. 
Cynthia, thank you so much. Um, this is Christopher again, everyone. Um, I'm going to help manage any questions that people might have. There is one question from Sarai in the chat um, asking if a nonprofit who provides housing and had to reduce it due to social distancing qualify for the credit. Um, and um, if folks want to add additional questions into the chat, please, into, sorry, into the Q&A feature at the bottom, please do so. Um, and I can also see if you raise your hand, if I can unmute you, I might be able to do that. I'm not sure if the settings are set up for that, but you could try that as well. Um, but the question from Sarai is, would a yep. nonprofit who provides housing and had to so reduce I it have, due to social worked, distancing qualify? Yep, they may well. I've, I've um, worked with a couple of homeless shelters, if that's what you're talking about. Um, and some of them had to shut down, but yes, let's say, what, so if you're paid by the, you're paid for performance, for example, like if you get uh, reimbursed for the number of people you house and you are housing less people because of social distancing, then very likely. So it's certainly worth looking into. Great. Um, uh, Soraya goes on to say, if they provided meals in their cafeteria, weren't able to anymore and had to do to-go meals, would that help qualify them? Yes, it would, especially again, if their funding changed or if the number of hours that, that if you continued to pay people that were no longer able to do their job, um, then yes. And Maybe Nathan less. Nathan Bradshaw asks if we had fewer employees during 2020 and 2021, are we still eligible? Yes, as long as you had any payroll at all, yes. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, you needed to continue to employ people because the credit is only, uh, it's calculated on a per employee basis. So if you had fewer employers, employees, you're eligible for less money, but if you meet the other criteria, that's fine. Great, thank you. Um, Orly from Vermont International Film Festival asks, um, in 2020, I had one employee leave in early April. A new employee joined immediately for three months, but then left because she was pregnant. The new employee joined the next day and is still with us. What are the implications of not having the same employees throughout? It, there are no implications. Again, we calculate on a per employee basis. So you, we'd look at each of those um, individually and you would be eligible for the same amount up to you know 5,000 or 7,000 per employee. So you could have a revolving, <laughs> could have a revolving door. That would have been a very clever uh, financial move is every one time someone earned ten thousand dollars you replace them that you would have uh, had you would have gotten twenty one thousand if there were three of them instead of one one employee that earned thirty thousand sure thank you um, Naomi asks if you could review the deadlines in a little more detail I'd read that it was three years from the date of the original quarterly return um, yes. so Q1 2020 can you talk more yes. about that? So that's what everyone thought. And that's what I was telling people. I think, I don't think that's on my website anymore. That's what everyone thought is that typically when you amend a return, you have three years from either original date of filing or when you, or when you, uh, when it was due, whichever is first. But it turns out that again, there's this very bizarre uh, sentence that the, that the IRS considers all 941s on time if filed by April 15th. So that is the date that is used. So it's now been uh, as of, and now if you Google that now, what is the deadline for ERTC? You'll find a number, many more places are saying um, that it is April 15th of 2024 and 2025 respectively. You know, I would recommend with all of these things that if you have an accountant that you <coughs> like to work with, that you do talk to them. What I find is that if your accountant knew a lot about these programs, they would have been talking to you about them. But it, but things like that, the deadlines they should be able to help with. Um, and you you remind me of a good point that wasn't in my um, presentation that I do want to say. The one financial risk of this <coughs> is that the IRS requires that if you receive ERTC funds that you amend the tax return for the period in which you're now reducing your your employee expense basically 
the 990 is not a tax return, it's a informational return. So that rule applies to for-profits, which is why I pretty much don't work with for-profits to do this program. Um, but they haven't, the IRS has not ruled on whether you would need to refile your 990. So if you get uh, ERC for 2020, it is possible that you will have to refile your 990. It, half the CPAs say, no, they won't bother. It's not gonna happen. The other half say, well, if the 1040s have to do it, then the 990s have to do it. Right now, that ruling hasn't been, hasn't been um, set. So I hope that the IRS will rule on that. And so there is the potential expense of needing to amend your 990. Uh, the CPAs that I've worked with say they're just going to put a note in the upcoming financial statements and not bother. Thank you so much. Uh, last chance if anybody wants to put any additional questions in the chat, um, or sorry, in the Q&A, um, we'll keep it open for another minute or so. Um, but we are approaching the end of our time. And I um, want to thank you, Cynthia, for doing this and also offer the opportunity for Amy to say any last words as well. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I hope that uh, some folks on this on this uh, webinar will be able to take advantage of this. There is one oh, final question. About, someone did ask one more question about backing out PPP wages, which I'll just um, mention quickly that yes, you need to back out your PPP wages. So if you, uh, one of the things I do is I ask people for the to look at the PPP forgiveness application that has the dates that were used. And we look at how much wages were used for PPP forgiveness and we back them out of total wages for that quarter to come up with the new qualified wages. Um, and that, and then in the narrative, you wanna make sure that you say no wages, no qualified wages uh, were used for PPP forgiveness. I am very happy to talk to anybody, you know, about this further. You have my contact information. You can book a, um, discovery call with me and you don't have to work with me, I'll be happy to just let you know, you know, to counsel you.